ashes, brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations, ye have seen his natal star. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Saints before the altar bending, watching long in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending in His temple shall appear. Angels from the realms of glory wing your flight o'er all the earth. He who sang creation story now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King.
wages wrong and strive to help some troubled soul. Life's evening sun is sinking low. A few more days and I must go to meet the needs that I have done. The cross and the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight.
Leo Chivirango, former governor, once again. We are also delighted to be with the So, dear mourners, join me to welcome the, the, the Deputy Governor Bank of Uganda, Dr. Michael Atinge, who has arrived, accompanied by the chairperson of the Medical Board Bank of Uganda, Dr. Oh, holy. 
do not pass me by, trusting only in thy memory, would I seek thy face, heal my wound that broken spirit, Send me by thy grace, call on the Savior, 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 hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by, thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me, whom have I on earth beside thee?
to you. And yet we know that, Lord, you are more than able. We give you thanks, our King of glory. We give you glory, we give you praise, we give you honor. Father, we surrender to you. We pray that you touch our hearts, O oh God. Even at this moment when we are in tears, we pray that, God, you release us, that we can see your goodness even in the land of the living. We thank you, our God and our Father, for in the name of Jesus Christ we have prayed. As we continue in the praises of the Lord, we need to know that life is a transition. And each one of us is going to transition from this world and go into eternity. When Job saw that his body was wearing away, in Job chapter 19, verse 25, he said these words, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Friends, with those words, can you be able to testify that your Redeemer lives? Can you be able to testify that when he comes again, you will see him face to face? Let's just take a moment once again to repent and bring our hearts before the Lord. And if there be anything that could stop you from seeing the Savior face to face, let's pour our hearts to the Lord and say, Lord, I just want to bring myself before you. I want to be a testimony like a Job, that even when he suffered, even when his flesh was wearing out, he was confident that when Jesus comes, he's going to see him face to face. Friends, the truth is that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. Will he find us worthy to be candidates of eternal life or candidates of condemnation? Just take this moment to open your heart and repent and ask the Lord to forgive you. If there be anything that could hinder you from entering eternity, this is the time to surrender and dedicate our lives to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, I am a sinner. I have sinned against you. Forgive me. And for sure, the Lord forgives, the Lord justifies, the Lord edifies, the Lord glorifies. And so the Lord is able to forgive you today and give you a new life. He says in Isaiah that even if your sins are red as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And so surrender to him this morning. He's, a, he's this afternoon. He's our God and our Father. And he's more than able. Just take two minutes to evaluate your life. Evaluate your life as an individual. Are you worthy? Are you a child of the kingdom of God? Is there something missing? Is there a way in which you want to bring your thoughts closer to the Lord? If you were the one who passed on to glory, like our brother Emmanuel, will you be with the Lord right now? Will we celebrate your life? there is something that you need to do about your life, just give away your life to the Lord now. And repent. And ask the Lord to forgive you. So that our hearts can be opened in celebration. After we have received the forgiveness from the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Almighty God, who promise forgiveness to all who pray repent, have mercy upon each one of us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all boldness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Praise will continue to sing the hymn on page three. Uh, the choir is going to be leading us in that hymn. Him number on page three, all hail the power of Jesus.
Amen. And together we are going to read Psalm 39. I said, I will watch my way. Sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remain utterly silent, not even saying anything good. My anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me while I meditated. The fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere breath, hand breath. The span of my years is nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, keeping up wealth, without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I will not open my mouth. For you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. Surely everyone is but a breath. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Do not be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner, a stranger, as all my ancestors were. Look away from me that I may enjoy life again before I depart and I am no more. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning and ever shall be world without end. Amen. We are going to take our seats and listen to the reading of the word. Let me invite Martha. From the book of Matthew, actually the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 36 to 39. Matthew 24, 36 to 39. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Thank you, and that's the word of the Lord. We are going to stand and sing that great hymn to God be the glory, great things he has done. Join the choir as we sing that hymn.
second reading uh, from Psalm chapter 4, the Psalm of David. Answer me when I call, call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? I know the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness, of right of the righteous, and trust in the Lord. May many Lord are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your faith shine on us. Fill my heart with joy. When their grain and new wine abound, in peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. and sisters in Christ Jesus, I join uh, the previous speakers to welcome all of us. This is such a sad moment in the life and the family of Bank of Uganda and the entire nation of Uganda, but also uh, for us who worship from all saints, cathedral where Professor Emmanuel has always been a member in the first service, 7.30 service every Sunday. I'm a bit shaky, but I pray that the Almighty God will give me the strength to give words that can comfort and strengthen each one of us, especially the family, and uh, more, more, more especially uh, Mama Betty, let us continue prayer. Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we once again thank you very much for this moment, a time you have granted to us to be in your presence as our God, our Father, and the Creator. Indeed, as many have just said, this is a, a very sad moment, very trying, but we know you with us, we can say you through. It's my prayer, therefore, blessed Lord, that as I stand before your children, we ask that you visit us in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Take your position in this, our gathering tonight, and through me speak your oracles to your children and bless us together in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to welcome all of us and I need to thank God for the life of our brother, our Professor Emmanuel Motevire. When this news came to us, we were saddened like many of you, but then as believers, we know very well that in this life we are just going through. This whole, this, this, this earth is not our home. This world is not our home. So our encouragement has roots in that faith, knowing that one day you are born, then you live on the many years God blesses you with, and then thereafter you go back to your Creator. But it is hurting and it's very painful. 
Sometimes you cannot stand and say, surely I have lost many people and I am now strong. So every single day, every single loss, you feel the pain. So now we want to sympathize and know with our friends in the Bank of Uganda, the directors, even the leadership of this nation, at the loss of our brother, Emmanuel. When the provost called me last night, I say you are requested or you are asked to give a word during this service. I thought about the fitting words from the scriptures that can give us encouragement at this time of loss, but also to help us know why we are here on this planet Earth. There are many people who are born and then they leave, but not knowing the reason or the purpose why God brought them on this planet Earth. But I want to, to tell you that was not Immanuel. He knew. And indeed the words I got from Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Only that verse. But there are several lessons we can learn together tonight. Acts chapter 13, verse 36. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, he was buried with his fathers, and his body decayed. For when David had served God's purpose, each one of us were created in the image of God. And it's not by mistake that you are where you are. We'll see that. And indeed God purposed that you are blessed where you are. So when King David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he died. Although this uh, new, uh, some scriptures, some versions say, he fell asleep, but that is dying. Then he was buried. So when, when Apostle Paul summed up the life, summed up the life of David, he described him as a man who served God's purpose in his own generation. So when I read this verse, I thought about the life of our brother Emmanuel. I said, surely there is a relationship between King David and also the life of Emmanuel, the life we are celebrating tonight. And now of what Emmanuel has done in this life, it can be a celebration, but I want to tell you that this is a very painful celebration, especially to you, workers of Bank of Uganda, the, the staff of Bank of Uganda, and Mama, Mama Betty Mutevile, and the entire family, we can say we are celebrating. Indeed, as my provost said, we are celebrating, but still at the same time, we are mourning. So when Apostle Paul summed up the life of David, described him as a man who served God's purpose in his own generation. And this means that David accomplished and fulfilled the purpose of God in his life. As I said the, at the beginning, that each one of us were created for the reason, for the purpose, you know. And through this scripture, Acts chapter 13, Verse 36, we can find four lessons that can help us to fulfill life of service as we continue in this work. To help us understand that we are called to serve God's purpose while still in this life. So we should not be tempted to forget 
that God blessed you in that office to serve his purpose while in that particular position. Many people think, I don't, but not you, those who are not here, that those who serve God are men of the collar or those who dress like this, like a child of uh, Sunday school, one Sunday morning he was asked why he, why she was going to church. And then she answered, oh, I just want to go and see those men in long dresses who are saying they are serving God. But you see, we can say we are saying, but all of us, where you are blessed, God expects accountability. After you have gone like the way Emmanuel God, you will stand to give that accountability if you really serve God's purpose. Look back and see the people who have not achieved up to that level, who have not come to that office. Don't you, do you think, don't you think that also desire to be like so and so, that you are there because God intended it and he expects you to be serving his purpose. So, in this Thanksgiving service, we are here to celebrate Professor Emmanuel Noteville's life, celebrating his achievements in life, celebrating his service and his contribution to this nation and to his church, the Church of Christ. But as we read and learn from this person, we just want to find out how did David serve God's purpose? How did he do it? There are four lessons, as I said. The first one, David served God's purpose for his family. That is number one. He served God's purpose for his family. And indeed, God created us for a purpose, and one of these purpose is to be active members of a particular family. And from there, a family, then these other institutions will be blessed. But if the family is not doing well, I want to tell you, things will not work out the way you want them to work out. So King David, in the text we have just read, he served God's purpose in his life by helping his family, supporting and helping and caring for his family. In 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 16, verse 19, we see that David cared for his family business and indeed was serving uh, the purposes of God and his family. In that part of the scripture, we see that he was sent, David was sent, sent to take care of uh, his father's flock. And indeed, there are some lessons here, because some of our young people today, they don't care how they spend the hard and the money of their parents. They are like the prodigal son. But this David knew that you see, this is our inheritance. And he had to support the business of the family. So David took care of the sheep of his father in, in the field. Now, most of us, we belong to families. Do we really serve the purposes of God in those families? You know, for us pastors, you people, you come and open up to us. Whereby, some people say, oh, oh, you know that family? You know my family, now my family members, now this is a husband. Saying, you know, when I come back, they call me police. The police is back. You see, because if I call the police in such a family, because you are not serving the purposes of God. Maybe you are scaring them. So David served the purposes of God, the purpose of God in his family. 
And I believe even our brother Emmanuel did that. For us who worship from all saints, Cathedral, even as we are coming down, we chatted with uh, with a provost. They have that name, Motebile. And then it's, provost was asking, you know, there is this grace Motebile, and then Betty Motebile, and many Motebiles. So they are proud of the name. But I think Emmanuel has been such a strong pillar in the family. And even the members of the family were happy to be identified with that name, Mutebile, because he's there to support them, to care for them, and in helping them. So in First Samuel, First Samuel chapter 17, verse 17, he said his father told him, told them to take forward his brothers who were on the battle on the battlefield. So you can see, that is David supporting his brothers who are fighting on a battlefield. So if we fail to serve our divine purposes for our family, we cannot serve well our purpose in our workplace and even in our community. So we start from home. And I think if Mama Beth was here, she would have testified to that effect. Some of us, we have visited their home, and I think we have enjoyed, and we have seen the love they shared. And here, I want to congratulate our mother, our sister, Betty, for graduating her life to eternity. Because one day, they, she stood, they stood, and then they promised together to keep the vows and the promises, and maybe they have kept it until Death. Because as they made their vow, they spoke better for us, for richer, for poorer, and sickness and in health, till death do us part. So they have served, or Emmanuel has served God's purpose to the extent of keeping the promises and the, and the vows made on the wedding day. Are you serving God's purpose? Are your family members happy? Are they really find it easy to identify with you? That is the first lesson. The second one, David served God's purpose for his workplace. David's destiny, as we read from the scriptures, was the throne. However, during the process of his preparation, he faithfully served as an arm, an arm bearer to King Saul. He proved it to be a faithful employee, employee before he could success, before he could be a successful employer. That is in First Samuel, uh, chapter sixteen, verse two. And indeed, as Christians, we should bring the refreshing and healing presence of God to our places of work and to our employees and employers, for those who are being employed and those who are employers. And I think in the Bank of Uganda, one time I had a chat with some of your members. I said, ah, in Bank of Uganda, it's a family. Even we can take loans without interest, and then we are encouraged to pay back, but after you have established yourself. So everybody would love to join Bank of Uganda. And I think we have to thank the directors, because that's what is expected elsewhere, that you support those who are working for you. They deserve a glove, despite the fact that we are in this celebration. So, David served God's purpose for his place of work. Are you really serving God's purpose where he has placed you in that office? But I, did, I think people in Bank of Uganda are happy because Emmanuel even supported all what you are enjoying 
the benefits in charge of your garden. It's the reason you're happy. And you feel like, oh, you have lost him. Who is coming in? Because some of us, when we are taking positions, oh, we grow wings. I'm a bishop. Don't you know that I'm a bishop of the Duchess of Kampala? You know? But you see, we grow. But Emmanuel was always down, down to earth. So we praise God for his love. And then the, the third lesson. David served the God is purpose for his country. So when duty to serve his country came, David did not hesitate to render service. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32, they said, Then David decided to Saul. By that time, Saul was the king. And David was ju just a young man. And he said, Let no man's heart fail because of him. And now because they are fighting with, the, with Goliath, your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. You see, he was willing to serve the purposes of God for his country. So Christians should be willing and ready when duty for country calls. As responsible citizens of heaven, we should serve the interest of the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you that the reason we are here for me, I joined All Saints Cathedral as the provost before I was elevated to this office of a bishop. But Emmanuel, as I said in the beginning, his first service is 7.30. His service is 7.30 every Sunday morning. So for him, he was there to serve the interest of, of, of God's kingdom during his life here on earth. I remember 2018, we had a, a function in his home to raise funds to, cause, to finish our, the cathedral we are building. And on that particular day, we lost another prominent member of the cathedral, Dr. Sheila Ndianavaj. And then Emmanuel and Mama Betty said, no, we can still go ahead because I invited the people to come and help me in this exercise. You know, some people were uh, yeah, excusing themselves, but because they had gone ahead to prepare, went one that particular evening, and many, some of you, many of you came. And from that gathering, I think we raised about 250 million for the new cathedral of all saints. Of all saints. So Professor served the interest of God's kingdom during his uh, life time. The question is, are you doing the same? So these are lessons we can learn as we celebrate the life of our uh, foreign uh, comrade. And then the last lesson, lesson four, he served his purpose for God. So David had only one purpose when he fought and faced the giant, not to get the prize from King Saul or to marry the daughter of the king, not to be popular or famous, not for personal uh, revenge, not to prove his skills in the battle and get promotion in the army. His only aim was that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that is first Samuel chapter, first Samuel chapter 17, verse 46. So brothers and sisters, as we celebrate, as we mourn the life of our brother Emmanuel. May the Almighty God help us to know that we are called in every office you are seated in. That you are called to serve the purposes of God. Because one day you give accountability. The challenge we have in this nation are people 
who are corrupt and they think the money they steal belongs to the government but not to Bishop Huntington. I say, ah, oh, what, what are you talking about? This is government money. Hey, but even with government money, you have to be faithful with that money. You shouldn't abuse the office where God uh, uh, stationed you. So God, and at the end of it all, we receive a reward. But we have to work and do God's purposes for our family, purposes for the places of work, our places of work, and then purpose for our country, to serve God's purpose for our country, and also to serve God's purpose for God himself. I want to end with a story. And I've, just, I've said this story once again and again, and I, I don't remember the author, but it's not my personal story. So this is a, a wealthy lady who died and went to, to heaven. So at the gates of, of heaven, she was received by an angel who offered to take her to her miracle, miracle house. So as they went along, she saw a beautiful cottage. And then she said, is that my miracle house? She asked. And then the angel said, no, that belongs to your driver. We are preparing that for him. Then within herself, she said, oh, how nice. The lady thought to herself, if my driver has such a beautiful cottage, I can't wait to see my miracle house. Further down the road, she saw a grand house, mansion, two stories high, complex, with a lovely garden. And then she, is that my miracle house? And then the angel again said, no, that belongs to your maid. We are preparing that for her. And then within herself, she said, marvelous. And then she, said, she thought within herself, if my maid has such a grand mercy, I can't wait to see my miracle house. So as they turned the corner, she saw a shark hardly standing and only half completed. And then she asked, what is that? What is that? And then the angel said, Oh, madam, that is your house. The lady couldn't believe what she saw, and the angel went ahead and explained, With the materials you sent us from earth, it is a miracle that we, should, we could build a house for you. So your service, while still in this life, is going to serve as materials to build a house for you in heaven. And indeed it is scripture, it's biblical. When Jesus Christ ascended to heaven in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 6, says, I go and prepare a place for you. I'll come back and take you. And you see, the foundation, the groundwork for you to go is to receive him. The one who says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And some of you didn't know that even Emmanuel, one day, he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of his life. But we live in this world with problems and challenges. Even like St. Paul, one time he had a problem, and he prayed to God, how many times? Three times. I said, God, why don't you take this from me? But God did not take it away from him. And God said, my grace, is sufficient for you. Maybe even Emmanuel with the challenges and problems of life committed and loved Jesus Christ to the extent that we can testify to that event. Maybe he prayed one day and said, God, why don't you take this from me? And maybe God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Brothers and sisters, may we continue to know that we are called to serve God where we are, and one day we'll give accountability of our service. May you might God bless you. Thank you.
inspiration for that message. A great man or a great woman serves God's purpose in his own generation. It's a challenge to each one of us, whether you are serving money's purpose, where you, whether you are serving your own purposes, or you are serving the purposes of God in this generation. And dear brothers and sisters, as the bishop has already mentioned, your miracle house depends on what you have invested in the economy of God. Whatever that we do here is sinking sand, but we need to build our houses on the rock, on the foundation that is going to last forever. And probably, as the bishop has been sharing, someone might have said, you know, I need to give my life to Jesus today. Friends, when we celebrate life like this, when we celebrate a man that has lived his life, we are challenged to just remind ourselves that without Christ, I cannot have a mansion in glory. The Bible says, Jesus said to his disciples that I'm going, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'll come back and take you. But we cannot go where we have not invested. We might have invested so much in this world, but we've not invested for eternity. I want to give us an opportunity this afternoon. You are there, and you are thinking, Lord, I want to invite you to come into my life today. And you can make a decision now, and you'll never regret that decision that you're going to make. And so, friends, we are going to sing a song, and we are going to invite you, if you chose Jesus this afternoon, if you choose to construct your house again, then we'll be able to celebrate together. And we're just going to sing a song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And as we sing that song, meditatively reflecting on our lives, and you really feel you want to give your life to Jesus, we'll invite you just to put up your hand where you are, and we'll be willing to pray with you this afternoon. So seated wherever you are, we are going to sing that song meditatively. Amazing, great, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
great joy to see someone lifting up his hand. Kindly, sir, let me request that you stand and we'll pray with you as you surrender your life to Jesus. There is, there is no shame in taking Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I want to encourage someone, you're seated and you're feeling the glory around you cannot allow you to stand. I just want to encourage you that you know the glory in heaven is far greater than the glory you have on earth. And I want to encourage you to take a step of faith. You don't know Jesus. There is no way you are going to transition into glory without Jesus. You don't know Jesus and you want to surrender. Even where you are sitting, I want to encourage you to say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for my life. I thank you, Lord, because you forgive sinners. I come before you as a sinner. I acknowledge my sin. I ask you to come into my life today. I surrender to you, Lord. I ask you to forgive me my sins and cleanse me with your blood. And today I declare within my heart and I confess with my lips that I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I promise that I will walk with you until I get to eternity. I surrender to you. Thank you, Lord, for my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Our Father, our God, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you, Lord, for your servant who has stood boldly to declare and to confess that Jesus is Lord. Father, we thank you for his life and we just dedicate him to you. We surrender him to you. We pray, our Father, and our God, that you receive him. You receive him, Lord. You forgive him and you walk this journey with him. Lord, we give you thanks even for the many others that have not been courageous enough to stand, but they have said yes to the Lord. Father, I pray that you reach out to them. Receive them on this great day. That it will be a wonderful testimony. That as we celebrated the life of Professor Mutebile, I gave my life to the Lord. What a word and what a great celebration. We give you glory, praise, and honor. For in the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Thank you so much. And may God bless you as you begin your new journey in Christ Jesus. To put it. Tendere Yesu so Yesu oi mwana kwandika Yesu Omsa kuna sisi ne wasa ola kosi Can we all stand and affirm our faith in the words of the apostles It's on page 10 I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We will take our seats, and at this point we are going to take an offering. And as a church, when we take an offering for a day like this, all the offering goes to the family. And so we want to ask us to give generously back to the Lord to be able to support the family and the choir will be ministering with the songs as they guide us.
Let us pray as we continue. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your faithfulness. We honor you, Lord, that you've given us resources, you have given us capacity to be able to work, and uh, out of that which you have entrusted to us, Lord, we have taken a part of it and we give it to you. Lord, specifically on this occasion, I ask that you bless this offering that comes to us as an offering to you in appreciation of your goodness and your mercies. Now we pray that, Lord, you sanctify it, set it apart. The Lord, your presence might go ahead of us. Return to your children with a blessing that has no sorrow, and let your presence never depart from them. Lord, let your spirit rest upon this bank. Let your spirit begin to guide all the directors and all the leaders in this institution. Lord, we pray that your purposes shall be fulfilled in this place. Even as we give this offering, and uh, as a part of what your servants will use, Father, in this occasion and throughout this season, Lord, bless it and bless them as well. We continue to pray for your servant, specifically uh, Madame Betty Mutabili, that Lord, you move through her life and teach her your ways. And Lord, above all, let her love for you in this season never diminish through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer, and I want us to pray for a few things out of what the message that Bishop brought, um, you know, uh, it came out very clearly. I want us to close our eyes. We're going to spend a few minutes asking the Lord. He talked more about serving God's purposes. And you know, for some of you, I know you've done this construction, you know, the, the, the purpose for a building they don't first begin to build and then they ask themselves, what, what, why are we building this building? No. They first design, they create it, and then that determines the purpose. God has created you. He has designed you in a way that you should worship him. I want us to close our eyes. As he spoke, maybe you have been serving wrong purpose. Maybe you have been doing things wrongly. Ask God for forgiveness. Don't look at me. Your own time will come. Ask God, if there be any purpose I have served that is wrong, Lord, have mercy upon me. Pray that prayer. Ask the Lord to forgive you. If there is anything I have done, I have moved towards the direction that is not godly. And you know in that Psalm 4 verse 3, the Bible said, the Lord sets the godly apart for himself. So lift up your voices in that very understanding. Ask the Lord for forgiveness. You have served wrong purposes. You have indulged in several things that have defiled the temple of the Spirit. The Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Ask God for forgiveness. If you are here and you have indulged yourself in things which are contrary to the Spirit of God, Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask the Lord to cleanse you. Ask the Lord to take away the entanglements of this world that have hindered you from serving the purposes of God. It doesn't matter whether you are here for business, you are here for Camila. This particular prayer is for every person that has realized that they were going a wrong direction. They now need to turn from that place and begin to take the direction of the Lord. Father, I ask that your spirit of conviction begin to move from one person to the other, convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. For on the day of Noah, the Bible says, as we read in the text, the people were eating and drinking, and they were doing it not knowing what was coming. Lord, may we never be found in a place of laxity. As far as your word is concerned, bring conviction on this day. Let it be recorded that somebody, just like our brother has done, somebody had a turnaround in their lives. Somebody had a turnaround in their destiny. Somebody had a turnaround in the way they used to serve this institution. Lord, you brought each one of us here for a purpose. We do not want to serve wrong purposes. Father, forgive us. 
where we have strayed away. Some of us have not depended on the power of the Spirit of God. Some of us have depended in our own strength. Some of us have served our own purposes. Some of us are just here for salary. Some of us have served the purposes of the witch doctors. Father, I ask that you begin to destroy all the strongholds, all the issues that have made us to serve other purposes. Lord, have mercy. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. Cleanse us. We have made our lives, Lord, to serve other purposes. We ask God that you forgive us. Continue in that prayer. As the bishop spoke, he also made mention of the issue of, you know, um, David being led by the Spirit. He served his nation because David was a king, a prophet, and, and you know, he, when David was the only man who was anointed three times. So, for you to serve God's purposes, you need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says Jesus was anointed. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. So you don't just come and say, so I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, release your spirit upon me. From today onwards, I'll choose to serve the purposes of God based on what your spirit is saying. Lift up your voices and pray that prayer. It doesn't really how much, uh, it doesn't matter who you are. What matters is that you are a human being and the spirit of God dwells in you. What that means is that the spirit, the Bible says, for those that are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. You cannot serve God's purposes without the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord to release the Spirit of God upon you as an individual. Maybe you are in a department and you full well know you are a director, you are a lead of that department. But the issue is that people don't serve God's purposes. There's malice, there's all sorts of things that are happening in that place. Ask the Lord to release His Spirit upon the people, upon your staff, upon every other person. Father, I ask that on this day, as you have challenged us on the issue of purpose, Lord, release your spirit so that every person here will serve the purposes of God. If there be any that is moving and walking about and they are serving their own purposes, Lord, I ask that you bring exposition, expose such persons in the name of Jesus. Make them to return to the very foundation. The Bible says that there's only one foundation that, uh, that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that the Spirit of God will dwell upon every department, upon men and women that will begin to pick up the burden of God, that will begin to serve the purposes of God in this institution in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, breathe new life upon departments. Breathe new life upon offices in the name of Jesus. That Lord God Almighty, when we come before your presence on the final day, Lord, we shall have a reward. There shall be a reward. Thank you, Lord. As we close the last prayer, I want you to ask the Lord. As Bishop was speaking, he made mention of the issue of foundation. You know, David was put on that position because God said he was looking for a man after God's own heart. What moves God is not the outward thing. What moves God is the inside, the deposit upon your spirit. That's what moves God. I want you to ask God to turn you into a man, a woman, after his own heart. Don't look at me. You know, intercession is you praying to God. Everybody close your eyes. Ask God, truly speaking, we are not here. We know Professor has done his journey. It's now your journey when you shall be brought wherever and you will be taken into God will hold you accountable. Ask the Lord, Lord, turn me. Give me a new heart. David came because he was a man after God's own heart. Father, I ask that you give each one of us a new heart, a new spirit, that that will enable us
to serve your purposes here in Bank of Uganda so that when our final day comes, we shall give accountability based on who we are. So, Father, take away all the outward things that have made us to be and humble us and bring us up, O oh God, to the place of humility in this season, especially in this particular week, as we reflect on the life of our brother, our father, our mentor, Professor Emmanuel. Father, I ask that you will reveal Jesus afresh for those of us who already know him. Lord, I continue to pray for the family members. I continue to pray for those who are close to him in this place. Lord, fill the gaps that might have been created because of his absence. Lord, fill those gaps. Fill the gaps everywhere. Let there be a person that will be somebody that indeed is seeking you, that will replace him. Lord, I ask for the grace that as we mourn, we shall not grieve as those without hope. We shall grieve and mourn as those with hope. And at the end of the day, when we go back, Lord, home or wherever, in our offices, Lord, I ask, take us back to our purpose, to our origin, for that thing that we are created for, for that purpose that you created for, to glorify you, to give you praise. May we never be a building that we just began to build and without knowing what we are going to use it for. We now began to guess, should we use it for this, should we use it for that? Father, may we understand our purpose and let this event register a major turnaround and a shift in the supernatural realm. We honor you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and everybody say, Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Felix. At this moment, I would want to invite the MC to take us with the speeches, and then we'll conclude with a blessing later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop. I want to request uh, the ushers, please come for this offering. Then you Thank you so much, Bishop and your team. And truly, we have been touched. I have personally picked one important life issue. when the devil served God's purpose. So thank you so much, church. Members, as we continue into morning, we have, uh, I think the appropriate word is thanksgiving. So as we continue into the thanksgiving, we have a few speeches. Uh, we have a page on our website called the late Professor Mutevili memorial page where you are encouraged to send all your messages. But we also have a staff wreath. Unfortunately, staff due to the SOPs, the government through the deputy governor we got guidance that uh, there is no rain the wreath, but we would rather recognize your wreath since they are already here. Uh, without any ado, uh, let me recognize the, the wreath from Bank of Uganda Christian Fellowship. Thanks, members. A wreath from Accounts Department, a wreath from SQA, National Payment System Department, two wreaths from PDD, and another one from Risk and Compliance Department. We have also received a message from DPF 
because it's protection fund. We have a message which we will share with you in due course. We have also former staff that we wish to recognize, that we hadn't recognized before. Mrs. Sarah Odongo, former EDO. Well, welcome. Mrs. Naomi Nasasra, former Director Currency, you are welcome. <laughs> Mr. Mwanga Zara, former Director Statistics, you are welcome. I can tell that due to public demand, I repeat that we, uh, we have Mr. Mwanga Zara in. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. So we have a few remarks. Uh, you have had members that uh, from the bishop's message, the late Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Mutebire was a big man and even in church and even spiritually and we know that he has gone to be with the Lord. We have been informed that the, the team at the airport, the team from Nairobi has, uh, there are indications that they have arrived, and so we will keep sharing with you and giving you the program for the national event and the barrio event in Kavari. Uh, dear staff, with the permission of Deputy Governor, the co-chair of the board and your board members, we request that we give a chance to a few staff, two of them, to give brief remarks in the form of a thanksgiving to our dear Governor, who has gone to be with the Lord. And with your permission, sir, we have only two speeches from staff, or theologies from staff. One Miss Jackie Nankumba, and another one from Miss Christine Arupo, the director currency. So join me to welcome Miss Jackie Nankumba to give her eulogy. We will keep it brief within five minutes or less. You are welcome, Jackie. Apologies, members. Um, the program, right now we, we will receive the remarks from the chairman, organizing committee of the commemorative, the chairman of the organizing committee, Mr. Solomon Okecho, to give his remarks. Welcome, Chair. Uh, the clergy, the Deputy Governor, 
Governor Emeritus, Mr. Leo Kibirango, board members here present, BO, members of the BOU Medical Board who are here, led by Dr. Ben Bonye, and I would like to ask Dr. Bonye to stand up for recognition. There are few opportunities that we, we have to meet the doctors. Dr. Bonye, please, just wait. I see Dr. Kagwa, our very own member of the medical board. Any other member of the medical board that I have not seen? Okay. Distinguished retired staff of the bank who are here with us, colleagues, all staff of Bank of Uganda, fellow mourners. First, on behalf of management, I wish to welcome you all to this occasion, organized to give honor to our late governor. I thank the clergy, Lord Bishop, the Right Reverend Dr. Huntington Mutebi, and your colleagues from All Saints Cathedral for honoring our invitation at a very, very short notice. Ubugalo for the clergy. In the same vein, I thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, who have made it here for putting aside everything else and deciding to be with us at this occasion this afternoon. Let me now say something about, about our late governor, and I will be very, very brief. Ladies and gentlemen, I would describe our departed governor, Professor Emmanuel Tumusimu Mutevide, as the lion of Bank of Uganda. He was indeed a lion in many respects. <laughs> However, let me restrict myself to the era I know best, staff welfare. He was indeed a lion of staff welfare. <laughs> Fellow mourners, the philosophy of central banks across the world is that long-term loyalty, commitment, performance, and integrity of staff hangs on security of tenure and golden handicaps. I wish to state here ladies and gentlemen, without any fear of contradiction, that the lion of staff welfare understood this philosophy very well. <laughs> Allow me to mention just a few examples. Number one, the reversal of talent exodus. Many of you will recall that between 2006 and 2011, staff left the Bank of Uganda from all levels, joining all kinds of organizations, including those ones as small as microfinance institutions. The governor, working with management and his colleagues at the board, reviewed salaries and benefits to a competitive level where those who had left the bank returned knocking at our doors. <laughs> Many of them, ladies and gentlemen, are still serving the bank in various capacities, including at very senior levels. <laughs> Moreover, ladies and gentlemen, this was at a time when the bank had already started posting deficits in its financial statements. Number two, review and strengthening of medical policy and services. It is the best in the region. Number three, staff bonus. There is 
no single year when the staff of the bank missed the 13th chair. Number four, and I will not go beyond this, pension reforms. When pensions were ridiculously low, our late governor saw to it that pensions were revised and enhanced. A second pension scheme, the DC scheme, was also introduced to cater for those who had been left out for a long time. Some of you may recall that some of our staff, mainly not examiners, had served the bank for as long as 36 to 38 years, but left without a pension. Fellow mourners, may the soul of our late governor, Professor Emmanuel Tumusio Tebie, rest in eternal peace. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairperson, for the kind remarks that truly brings out what Governor stood for uh, regarding staff matters. We have also received two wreaths. Uh, one from Agricultural Credit Facility, Division of Bank of Uganda, thank you. And another one from Bank of Uganda Retired Staff Association. Thank you so much. So the next person on the agenda is none other than the Chairperson Medical Board Bank of Uganda, Dr. Ben Bonye. You are welcome, sir. Deputy Governor of Bank of Uganda, uh, my Lord Bishop of Kampala Diocese and your team, the directors of the Bank of Uganda, and all the senior members and other members of staff of Bank of Uganda here with us today to celebrate the life of our friend, uh, Professor Emmanuel Mutebi. I was asked to make some few remarks about the health issues in Tevere. Uh, Professor Tevere had been battling diabetes and high blood pressure for many years. And as you know, many people do live with diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, keep them under control, but sometimes they develop complications. And in his case, he developed complications of that combination of both type of hypertension and diabetes. One of some of the complications which diabetes normally causes is um, damaging blood vessels and damaging nerves. And blood pressure, high blood pressure also has got a complication of damaging blood vessels as well. And so he developed these complications and one of those complications of nerves is what we call peripheral neuropathy, affecting the nerves of the periphery of the body that's in the hands and, and, and the legs. And one of the neurological problems which results from that is failure to, for the joints to recognize where they are. And that affected some of his feet 
and he started sometimes stating on the wrong side of the foot and that caused him some what we call pressure sores because of stating on the wrong side of the foot because of the uh, joints not recognizing where they are. So he suffered that problem of neuropathy. Some of you might have seen the way he was walking, sometimes stumbling, sometimes falling. Many people didn't know why he was falling, but that was a result of peripheral neuropathy, which I've talked about. Then a combination of blood pressure and diabetes also hits hard the, the, the kidneys. He developed kidney complications, which led to chronic kidney failure and eventually came to terminal stage and he started having dialysis from the time his kidneys got damaged. And we continued to manage those complications both within and outside the country. And recently, last year, we started having challenges of some of the complications again that normally follow the uh, uh, dialysis. When dialysis is applied to the body for a very long time, it also gets some of the some complications. His heart started getting affected as well, and we had to, ma to manage that complication as well. Last year, we started having problems again, mainly so of the of his sores. We called in consultants who work on, uh, on, on wounds. We try, we try to manage it, we try to correct the shape of the foot as a result of the neuropathy. But because of, we had wanted him treated outside, but because of the challenges of COVID last year, we postponed sending him out until around November, when some of the countries started opening up. A decision was made to refer him to a hospital. After consulting several other hospitals, we found a hospital which we thought was appropriate in Abu Dhabi, an American hospital, actually, American hospital called Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi, where we sent him in November of last year. He was there for a period of time, he was reviewed, his foot was treated and realigned, his catheters for dialysis was also changed, and he returned in December. A day or two after his arrival, he started getting some complications of infection, blood pressures falling, and oxygen also for him. He needed oxygen at regular intervals. He was admitted to the Hospital, managed and discharged to go and have Christmas with his family. He had Christmas with his family, he was all right. And just before, after Christmas again, those complications of oxygen requirement uh, evidence of infections and blood pressure not being controlled started coming in again. He was readmitted. Efforts were made by specific doctors, the nephrologists who look after kidneys, the cardiologists, and the, uh, those who look after wounds looked after him. But around the second, I think 30, 31st, 30, 31st, uh, on the 1st of January, a decision was made that we needed some extra expertise somewhere else. He was not in a condition where we could fly him long distances, so a decision was made to refer him to Nairobi. He was admitted to Nairobi Hospital, where he was immediately admitted to the intensive care, and they started working on him to sustain his blood pressures up. They changed his catheter because of infections in his blood system, continued to manage his, his uh, oxygen, and uh, uh, unfortunately continued to, to deteriorate. He was not getting better, and 
uh, as you heard a few days ago, we are informed about a quarter to five or five o'clock that he had breathed his last. We had, however, been informed at regular intervals, very regularly, by his family, which was with him, by our Dr. Javira, a doctor of the bank, we have been, and the Professor Uli, who was in charge of the team that was managing him in Nairobi Hospital, we are being gradually appraised of what was going on. And that's the story of what happened. What caused problems were simply complications of his diabetes and blood pressure. And eventually he died of uh, what we call multiple organ failure. Now, um, I, I can't stop without really thanking the team that has been behind his management, medical treatment. It's the team that was managing him at home. The team that was managing him at home, led by Professor or team. I don't know whether he has come, whether he's with us. Professor Tim was leading a team that was managing him at home. Dr. Kagwa, Apollo Kagwa, who is here with us. Dr. Weiswa from the bank, Director Medical. <laughs> Dr. Javira, who is now with him in Nairobi, and he has always been with him whenever he was traveling abroad. <laughs> then there was the Dr. Uh, Sekasangu, managing the, 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 the kidney problems. <laughs> Dr. Ben King, and then the, the Dr. Santongo, who were managing his wounds and I was part of that team as well, managing him at home. Um, so I want to thank them very much because we were meeting regularly at home and whenever it became necessary, we always recommended that he should be referred abroad. The second person who support, supported us in his treatment was Mrs. Betty Motevide. I cannot stop emphasizing the fact that she played a very big role, not simply being a wife in the house, but she was very, very committed to making sure that he had quality medical treatment. I want to thank her. She's right now, she's in Nairobi all the way, and, and she always made sure that whenever there was need for treatment, she always participated in the care. In the, in the discussions we had about his medical care, Betty was always part of the discussion and the decision making and we always respected whatever contribution she was making. So I want to thank her for that. There was a girl called Rose, who was a managing her dialysis at home. She played a very big role, and Mr. Dongo for his, I think, and also the physiotherapy team from Bank of Uganda. I want to thank you very, very much. When we, we used to go to treat him at home, uh, the deputy governor, most of the time, came and joined us when he was admitted in the Kassel Hospital. Deputy governor joined us there and participated in the discussions. When it became necessary to refer him to Nairobi, he participated in the decision making. When he was, he was referred, the decision was made on a Sunday afternoon, about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. The bank was closed, but he mobilized all the resources and we managed to evacuate him that very evening. <laughs> Not only that, but during the time he's been in Nairobi, the deputy governor made it a point to go and visit them and be with them and be by their side. So deputy governor, your actions did not pass unnoticed. We appreciate very much your standing by your colleague you are standing by the family in hard times. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't have much to add. I haven't gone into too much detail of what the illness was, but broadly, that's exactly what happened. At the end of it all, doctors can only try to reconstitute a body. Whether you go or you stay is God's decision. Thank you very much indeed, and I would like to wish 
our friend that she so rests in peace. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mbonye. And I request that we give you another round of hand clap together with the whole party. It's now the turn of, uh, to come and uh, briefly talk about their uh, former governor. Ms. Jackie Nangumba of Security Department. And you will be followed by Ms. Christina Rupo in that order. As she comes, we wish to recognize all executive directors, directors, and we appreciate your presence. Thank you. Good evening. When it is a weekend, oh, 
Depute Governor, Governor Emeritus Dr. Leo Kibirango, Executive Directors, Directors and Assistant Directors, Members of Staff, Protocol Observed. God is good. God is good. Glory be to God. My name is John Baptist Balinda. Today, we are gathered here to celebrate the life of our father, the late Professor Tumsine Ntegle, Governor, Bank of Uganda. All Bank of Uganda staff, myself inclusive, we are blessed to have worked under the guidance of Professor Tumsime Mutebile. The great man of our country and the region of East Africa, the entire African continent and globally. I personally thank the Almighty, our Heavenly Father, for granting me the opportunity to serve the governor as his personal chauffeur for 21 years. God is great. Who I am, I, to serve such a great man of our country. Bank of Uganda staff, the late Governor Professor Emmanuel Tumsin and Tegle, cared, treasured all of us, we are his children. Why I say so? It is because he commanded a fatherly figure. Take it from me. From the high-ranking officials of Bank of Uganda to us, the lower Cadiz, he was a father to all of us. His generous heart <coughs> touched so many lives. He helped and contributed to so many, such as paying school fees for the needy children, tuition fee for those in higher learning institutions, introductions, weddings, churches, hospitals, mosques, among others. The gentleman had a very big heart. Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Tegle trusted his staff. Take it from me. And who was very kind to all of them. I'm a witness and a beneficiary of this. He never <coughs> ever 
entertained ghosting. Not a single hour, or even a minute, or a second. I, don't, I do not remember any single day when I heard the governor were coming in any gospel of anybody, whether on phone or in gathering with his friends. No, not at all. For the last 21 years, I served him. This is a man who was of a few words, used to make very few phone calls, very few, but good at answering incoming calls and good at listening, but with very brief, simple replies. For example, yes? Okay? Sorry. <laughs> Those moments when the caller insists on the issue, then it was a big no. Please, no. And that's and he puts the phone down. <laughs> That's the end of you. <laughs> Professor Emmanuel Tomisime Mutabile was a very humble man, highly disciplined, honest, hard-working gentleman, yet commanding a lot of respect. at the bank and wherever we go with him around the country. Professor Emmanuel Tumisime Mtevili had no tribal or religious discriminations. <laughs> he was a devoted Christian, a very excellent singer during church services. <laughs> Professor Emmanuel Tumsine Mutovire was approachable. Sachin was a great gentleman. We, Bank of Uganda staff, thank God for having served under the leadership of the longest central bank governor one of the Africa's longest serving government. <laughs> he won several times several African Central Bank's accolades. It is a big loss to our country, the region of East Africa, the entire African continent, and the globe. We extend our heartfelt condolences to his immediate family, friends, and the Bank of Uganda family. I and my family pray to the Almighty, rest Professor Emmanuel Mutevi's soul in eternal peace. Glory be to God. In conclusion, may God give us a perfect fit for Governor's big shoe. Because truly, Governor's put the stakes so high. Farewell, be Papa, and friend, and may he join the angels in heaven. Eternal rest grant unto him, O oh Lord. Let perpetual light shine upon them, may they rest in peace. Dear Governor, you shall be missed and uh, cherished forever in our hearts. I received a text which I like to share. I, in honor, staff recommendation.
question uh, uh, about the canopy and the renaming, renaming the lane connecting to Plot 45 um, as a uh, way. That is for management to think about. And, uh, it is a view of one of your staff who has sent a text here saying, please consider naming one of, if not that, uh, rename Plot 45 the Mutevile Annex. Because Plot 45 has no meaning for them and they will feel comfortable if you name it Mutevile Annex. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you, team, and uh, another round of handcraft. Um, may I invite uh, Ms. Christine Arupo, Director Currency, and as she comes, we announce the, that the Currency Department has also brought in a wreath. Thank you. Thank you, MC, my Lord Bishop Huntington Mutebi and the clergy, the Deputy Governor and members of the board of the bank, the medical board, the Mutebi family, if they are represented here, Governor Emeritus Leo Chivirango, um, Executive Directors, Directors, our beloved retired staff, in your various capacities. I've seen all, all uh, levels of seniority represented. Distinguished guests, my fellow grieving yet thanksgiving staff of Bank of Uganda, it is with great humility that I stand here before you, having been one of those lucky to be requested by the bank to pay tribute to the governor. The governor who we are all honored to have worked with directly or indirectly. I personally worked closely with the governor during my deployment in the bank secretariat, which is also the board secretariat, both as director of board affairs and as director of communications. It is when I served as Director of Communications that I gained the closest insight into the man, into his character, into his personality, how he expressed what he stood for, and how he treated people in the course of dispensing his duties. It's therefore from here that I will draw most of what I want to share with you today. A quote often attributed to Abraham Lincoln says, character is like a tree and reputation like a shadow. The shadow is what we think of it, the tree is the real thing. Today I want to speak of Governor Emmanuel Tunsime Mutebile in terms of the real person I saw from the lens of a staff member, a director in his service, and simply a human being. I will therefore refrain from speaking of his works as an economist of lofty uh, achievements and leave that to the subject matter and public affairs commentary that uh, no doubt the bank will be part of when we publish something in his honor. So in the interest of time, I will only cite three attributes or three experiences of mine with the deceased governor that I believe resonate with most, if not all, of you. The first one, which I learned in the process of developing or otherwise uh, organizing the governor's communications, is that true to character, he wanted his messages to be bold, 
courageous, and unambiguous. He wanted his truth to be heard clearly and strongly defended it wherever and whenever he had to. It is said that being candid and blunt in speech, in speech is wired into the DNA of the subregion he hails from. And sometimes we joked that uh, some particular speeches had actually been delivered in Ruchiga, but the audiences had heard them in English. From my perspective, the real value of this clarity was that the central bank's policy positions, intentions, and guidance on important things reached the industry and other stakeholders quickly and clearly, consistent with the objective of central bank communication. I will cite just a few of these instances that I'm sure many of us remember because some of them were noisy and for which I had the benefit of a ringside seat. So my first example was in 2011 when the bank had to raise the central bank rate to 23% to combat inflation. We all remember what was happening at the time. And the governor promised that as a result of the bank's policy actions, inflation would be down to a single digit by the end of the following year, calendar year 2012. Against a torrent of uh, public commentary, some of which was harsh and personally directed, he remained clear and steadfast. And inflation did indeed, as if it feared the governor, retreat to a single digit by the end of 2012. It is hard to quantify what this did for the credibility of messages from the bank on anything that followed during that time. And altogether, this made the work of communicating the bank for the bank more pleasant. My next example was in 2016, when pressure was mounting for Uganda, like had happened elsewhere in the region, to put a cap on control interest rates, lending interest rates. Once again, the governor's frontal explanation about why this was not an optimal choice for the country quickly gained traction and, and shaped the debate. I think it did not go as far as it could have gone. As someone who at the time was responsible for putting the bank's official position through various channels, the sheer knowledge that you're delivering the governor's unambiguous message had the effect of an energy drink on the teams that went on outreaches. I could cite many more, but what I took away from observing was that was the importance of communicating what needs to be said, when it needs to be said, to whom it needs to be said, and that while it might be uncomfortable in the moment, truths eventually and inevitably have to be confronted sooner or later and better sooner. Many and sometimes complex dynamics around organizing the bank's high-profile events and engagements with local and international stakeholders. In many instances, we propose things we had not done before, and his buy-in was all you needed for the team to be inspired to work literally like machines uh, on getting across what the governor had endorsed. So even when the circumstances were delicate, he listened, advised, guided, and often went down to teaching us the detail of clean Oxford English, and then he owned the product. I personally had many experiences of working with him to navigate delicate messaging, and over time, my team and I got to learn how to pitch what would be acceptable to him even when he was not readily accessible. One of my most vivid personal experiences was when in 2015, having undertaken foreign travel, which included a medical review, the speculation and social media misreporting reached fever pitch, and we had begun to fall behind the narrative, which at this point had also invited inquiries from international financial press. Under difficult circumstances, we did what, what we thought was best, and I might remind Dr. Mbonye that during this time I had conversations with him. But knowing what tangible executive backing meant to his foot soldiers in challenging times, 
as soon as it was feasibly possible for him to have a call with staff like me who were removed from his immediate uh, need to talk to at the time, he called me on a Saturday morning for a brief chat only to say, I have seen what you people put out. I have reviewed what's going on. Thank you for how you handled the reporting. If phone calls could be framed and kept during that difficult time, I would have framed that phone call to keep playing for myself uh, to help me keep going. The least lesson for me was that when teamwork and shared ownership are in play, we can face the most daunting circumstances. We've seen the governor be brave and courageous. In the most daunting circumstances, our teamwork, shared ownership, executive backing, you can face anything. Let me end with the side of the governor, and this is my third takeaway, that from my perspective gave him the greatest purpose, care and compassion for the dignity and humanity of others, close or far. We have heard from those who worked with him directly in support roles, how much he cared for their personal being and welfare. I got the sense that of all the things he did, he was at his happiest when he helped someone in a vulnerable position. I watched how he spoke to students who had the courage to walk up to him, for instance, after a Joseph Mugri lecture, or how he spoke to staff members who were not in his usual orbit of uh, interactions. He was kind and generous and did his best to humanize the weight of his office, which as we all know, could be intimidating because of its responsibilities. He was in person a refined gentleman who enjoyed a good laugh and was a pure joy to serve. It is impossible to exhaustively document the support he has championed to communities. Uh, Jackie has talked about that. For instance, through the Rotary Movement where he was a leading member and other organizations. The bank CSR support for consequential initiatives such as the Rotary Cancer Ward, the Rotary Blood Bank, Mulago Hospital, and the ongoing maternal health centers were to a great extent inspired by his bold desire to help impact communities positively. That these initiatives are spread all over the country is a tes testament to one of the things people say about our late governor. Where you came from, who you were, your position on the social ladder, was simply useful additional information, but it really did not matter. It did not matter insofar as he had to make a decision for you, concerning you. There is a quote whose author I don't know that says, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. I don't know the author of that quote, but I agree with, I hope it's a her or him. The governor certainly was a man who wielded power in his lifetime, and it's a testament to his character that he used this power, according to him, to do good for his country, the bank, and those he impacted. I will conclude by saying that the best tribute we can pay our deceased governor is to emulate what we each learn from his contribution and his character. My eulogy is by no means exhaustive. We can talk about it many more things, but this is what I have to share. So I address this to the 40 staff who have just joined us. And you have a clean white slate to write on. You have a good place to look for inspiration to grow your career as a central banker. For the rest of us here and our colleagues watching this event online from Arua, Fort Porto, Gulu, Jinja, Kabale, Lira, Masaka, Mbale, Mbarara, where we have staff, let us cherish the memories of the governor we knew. If the governor was here, he would at this exact moment have interjected with a phrase he coined and which we are very familiar with, Obugalo. So let us clap for him. To Mrs. Betty Mutebile and your family, we share our condolences with you at this time of loss. Fare thee well, Governor. It was a singular honor to be in your service. 
Your candle has burnt out, but your legend will live on for a very long time. May the Almighty God grant you the gift of eternal life. Thank you for listening to me. so much Christine and uh, also a thank you to the two colleagues that have spoken and we give you all of that. So dear mourners, we, as I mentioned before, we received the condolence message from DPF and they are saddened to receive the news of the passing of Governor Mtebile, and they will never forget his efforts to establish the fund. And they wish him uh, well in the next journey of heaven. It's signed by CEO Julia Oyet. They have also issued another message to the family addressed to Miss Betty Mtebile, and it will be accordingly passed over to the family. Thank you so much, DPF. Uh, dear members, I think you have witnessed that uh, close association with someone actually causes an effect. When you hear Christine and the, the colleagues that have given remarks, you really see that the Mutevile effect will never go away. I have asked a here to translate in Ruchiga what uh, it means by get it from me. I've just learned that uh, it means that Ninye Nachigama. And in Uganda it means Nzachi Gandhi. That's Nzachi Okete. So you, you can really see that that is the to be too blunt and daring. I, I wonder if that uh, boldness will ever go from them. The next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is the representative of the retirees, and they will be represented by Mr. Joram uh, Kenano for my idea. You are welcome, sir. and management committees of the Bank of Uganda, and your team from Kampala Diocese and All Saints Cathedral, staff members of Bank of Uganda, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank God for his love and goodness and for giving this country Professor Emmanuel from Simon Tebide, who lived a purposeful and productive life as he worked with and among us. Allow 
me to thank the Deputy Governor and the Bank of Uganda for organizing this service to give us an opportunity to celebrate the life of Professor Mtelio. The print, broadcast, and social medias have reported extensively about Professor Mtelio, the economist and profession of her excellence and the lead architect of the recovery of the economy of Uganda in the mid in the mid 1980s. I will talk about Professor Mtevile, the governor I worked with, and Professor Mtevile, the person I have been privileged to know personally for over 50 years. Professor Mtevile's association and influence in the Bank of Uganda did not begin with his being appointed governor. Because when he was permanent secretary in the Ministry of Planning, he was also chairman of the Agricultural Policy Committee, whose secretariat was hosted and partly financed by the Bank of Uganda. Also, as PS. ST, he was a member of the Board of Directors. So his association goes far back. Professor Mtevili, as governor, allowed debate and exchange of ideas, especially in the areas of monetary policy and financial markets development. Professor Mtevili encouraged young officers to attend Monetary Policy Committee, make presentations, make their positions, and defend those positions, and then affirm with them. This increased their confidence. He thus created a cadre of assured, skilled officer corps, whom he then sent out to represent him and the bank whenever he needed a role. Perhaps in my estimation, this was his greatest contribution to the bank. As a person, Professor Mtevile was a very, very kind man. And underneath the tough exterior lay a man who loved people very deeply. I'm aware, and I know paid school fees for many underprivileged children from across Uganda with his own resources. One day, I found a former staff of the bank who had an uncommunicable condition and was sought of resources for medicine. I discussed the issue with Professor Mtevile. When he's returned later from his next visit to London, he put me in touch with a young lady and worked with Dr. Kawa to craft, craft the bank's own scheme for which we, who are retired, are extremely And Professor Mtevile loved the job. One day I asked him, Mtevile, why do you use L instead of R in your name? And he told me when he went to study in London, everybody started calling him Newt Bayer. He said, Newt Bayer does not mean anything. So I decided to change the letter to L so that now they would call me Newtbio. So Newtbio seems to mean something. That was Professor Mtelili. So friends, let's keep his family in prayer, and especially Betty, his dear wife, and Duncan, his son. Let's also keep the bank in prayer 
that the good Lord's presence and peace will be with you for the good of the country and the glory and honor of his holy name. Amen and thank you. So about that, the EDS seem not to be here. Allow me to take this opportunity to invite our dear board member, Madam Josephine Osia, to come and address you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, the clergy, and all other protocol observed. It's indeed a very sad day, but death comes to all of us, and therefore it's important that we celebrate uh, our governor, Professor Emmanuel Tumusigna Mutebele. I'll begin my brief remarks with uh, a stanza from a poem that says that they shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Indeed, we will really remember Professor Emmanuel Mutelili for the legacy that he has built over the years in public service. And a lot has been said by all the previous speakers. So on behalf of the board of directors, I extend my deepest condolences to the governor's family, and especially his wife, uh, Betty. The Bank of Uganda family, the banking fraternity, Rotarian, the Chigezi commun community, and the entire nation of Uganda. For indeed, this nation has lost a son who has devoted his entire career to the service of the people. And I was listening, and I was looking at his profile and listening to what they were uh, about him. In 1972, he was killed president and had to go to exile. Imagine, some of us were not yet born, but he had already started serving this country. That is how much of his life he has given to the country. Governor Mutemile has led this bank during a period of many unprecedented changes the economic downtown, and uh, uh, Christine also talked about it during this time of technology, and now during the COVID-19 pandemic. And for sure, for us as a board, we are going to miss his, his steadfast leadership and his experienced hand, and the guidance that he used to give us. But nonetheless, we take comfort in the fact that governor has always placed the development and the welfare of staff at the top of his agenda. And, uh, 
Didi Okecho talked about him about being the lion of staff welfare. Indeed he was. And his kindness and generosity, and he was humble. And I remember the first time I went to the board and uh, he called me Madame Josephine. I almost fell off my seat. I was like, how can the governor call me Madame? And I was quick to ask him, please don't call me Madame, because I felt and I should be the one who should be at his service. But that's how humble our governor was. Many of us have benefited from governor's dead hand in managing people. He championed staff as that has already been paid. And he also attracted a team of very competent people. And I can, without reservation, this bank has a lot of competent people. And we have seen the talent that is in this bank. And a lot of this is attributed to governor. We know that he has served this bank for 21 years and 10 days as chairman of the board. And he's done amazing things. Uh, Christine talked about managing the inflation in October 2011 and all the different things that he did, championing the central bank's independence. Even when, uh, I remember the time in parliament when the Kosase probe was going on and there were all these things about, in, uh, about the independence of Bank of Uganda, but he was very steadfast and resolute in his view. That is the governor that we had. He meant well for everyone. And he established a very good record uh, in this country. And it will be very hard for us to match that. We are going to miss him because of the, his character, the person he was. However, we should draw some key lessons from him. All this should not be in vain. As Christine said, the best way we can honor him is for us to continue to exude those things that meant well for him. And for me, the one thing that I would like to emphasize is Governor Mutebile always lifted other people up. He meant well for everyone. Whatever decision he took, whether it, even if others thought it was not good, he meant well for everyone. And I think that is the one thing that we should take. He, did, he used his position for good. He did not use his position for other things. He used his position for good to lift other people. And that is what we are going to remember him about. So as we sit here today, we need to reflect about what we are going to do individually. I know there's a lot of, usually human beings, in my, in my other uh, circles, we have a term where we call PhD. Yes, the PhD, there are so many PhDs in this bank, the academics, but there are also PhDs of pulling down or pull her down. Let's stop that. Let's, let's, let's move forward and learn lessons from, this, from our governor. Let it be known that when Governor Mutebile left the Bank of Uganda, he left such values and we continue to uphold them of lifting other people up. We are going to go through a season with Governor not here. We are going to miss him. But I think if we stay together as a unit and we support each other, we will get through this. And therefore, as I end, I just request that let's, we are a family and let's work together to make this family even stronger. Families have issues, we fight. Let's, let's, let's handle our issues internally. Let's not go running out into the external, uh, to external people to solve our problems. Let's stay one as a family. And with that, Professor Mtemile will not only live on in the walls of Bank of Uganda, but also in the annals of Uganda's history and in our hearts and minds. And he, he lives a very grateful family. We are so grateful for the things that we've learned from him and how he treated us and how he made us feel. To Governor, fare thee well, our dearest leader and colleague, until we meet again. May his soul rest in eternity.
Um, very good evening to you. Um, we are here all as mourners. So I will not dwell so much into protocol, but nonetheless, I want to recognize members of the clergy, colleagues, staff in Bank of Uganda, retired staff, and uh, those from other institutions who are here with us. Um, ladies and gentlemen, It's with a very heavy heart that I stand before you here today. We've lost our leader. I would have loved to talk about my personal relationship with the fallen gallant governor, but I'm constrained I'm going to talk about the bigger picture. Let me begin by saying I feel no hesitation in saying that many among the staff body are going to feel orphaned because Professor Emmanuel Tomsiven Mutegile was more than a boss. He was a parental governor. Colleagues and members of the extended Bank of Uganda family, let me say it is an honor to celebrate, remember, and pay homage as we bid farewell to Professor Tumusile Ntivile, to Mrs. Betty Chacho Tumusile Mutevile, the children, the extended Mutevile family, and all the Banya Chigezi, our hearts are with you and with all those across the country and indeed with those around the world who grieve the loss of this gallant governor of the central bank, an exemplary public servant and a patriot. All we can do is to surrender Professor Tomusime Mutavile back to the Creator who gave him to us. As we mourn, our faith tells us that there is indeed a life beyond the grave and that God remains faithful to all those who believe and follow him. So, let's give thanks for the leadership, generosity, of spirit, the kindness, and as well as the courage that have passed through Professor Tomusime Mutevile in his life, into the lives of us all as it has been our desk. Let's give thanks for the gracious gift of the noble qualities of mind, heart, and soul that endeared uh, him to multitudes here in the bank, across Uganda, and all over the world. He served his country, continent, and humanity, especially through humanitarianism, and has been and will remain a blessing to all of us. In the words of St. Paul, the Apostle, Professor Thomas Mimutebele has fought the good fight is kept the faith. May God who gifted us with his life bless and keep him in glory always. As you are aware, um, Professor Tumisime Mutegre has been a governor of Bank of Uganda since January 2001. He was a seasoned professional economist, a revolutionary reformer, who spearheaded the design and implementation of the economic recovery program that restored Uganda from the economic crisis of the 1970s and 1980s to sound economic performance during his service as a permanent secretary, stroke secretary treasurer in the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. It is undeniably true that Professor Thomas Mutebile was a chief architect in the achievement and maintenance of macroeconomic stability 
by the Minister of Finance under his technical leadership in instituting sound budget management during the 1990s. I dare say that the Bank of Uganda would not have managed to control inflation if the government, with the firm leadership of Professor Thomas Mnuchabili, had not exercised fiscal discipline. Having, having slain the dragon of inflation in the Ministry of Finance, he became governor of the Central Bank and successfully steered us to maintain price stability to date. Our gallant governor also led the radical reformation of the Uganda financial system, the liberalization of the financial markets, and the strengthening of prudential regulations, first from the Ministry of Finance, and then continued this path through deepening the financial system development while minding soundness while minding his soundness as the governor of Bank of Uganda to date. So our governor led the attainment of numerous achievements by the Bank of Uganda, including first, maintaining low and stable inflation during his tenure, averaging well within the medium term target of 5%, successful modernization of our monetary policy framework to meet the growing intricacies of the global and domestic economy. He also implemented wide-ranging reforms and programs aimed at ensuring stability, soundness, and efficiency of the financial system. He also championed progress towards financial inclusion and access by the population to financial services through reforms such as agency banking, modernizing the payment system, through the implementation of the National Payment Systems Act to maintain the pace with current developments and innovations. And finally, what I have here is success, the successful administration of the government's agricultural credit facility in 2009 to ease the binding constraints to agricultural financing, thereby unlocking its transformative potential of agriculture. And this is only to name but a few. Of course, there have been some challenges along the way, but those are inevitable. These are inevitable growing pains of any dynamic institutions. We cannot live without them. With his leadership and guidance, the challenges have been met with appropriate reforms to take the bank to the best that it can be going forward. Colleagues, on that note, I want to restate the words by uh, Director Josephine. I want to make this the most heartful appeal to each one of us. Governor Tumusime has achieved a lot in Bank of Uganda institutions, Uganda as a country, and the region as a continent. Let us honor our departed governor by giving him a befitting farewell. And this befitting farewell can only be achieved if we unite and work together for the good of this institution to benefit the country. That's my appeal to all of you. Um, Nelson Mandela once remarked that death is a frightful disaster, no matter what the cause and the age of the person affected. But in this our most frightful and disastrous moment, we are comforted by the words in the book of John, chapter 11, verses 25 to 26, stating that Jesus said to her and his mother when Lazarus had died, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. In that very chapter, in verse 35, it continues to say that when Jesus demanded to go to the tomb of Lazarus, they opened it. And one of the shortest verses in the Bible, verse 35, say, Jesus wept. If the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can weep at the death of somebody, 
I think it's okay for us to feel emotional about the loss of our government. Before I end, I want to re echo the words of Solomon that we've lost a lion of staff welfare. Dr. Mbonye mentioned that on the day the governor was evacuated to Nairobi, he called me, I went to the hospital where he was. I was chatting outside the veranda with Dr. Mbonye, then I was called that the governor wants to talk to you. I went to the bedside of the governor and he said, did you sit here? I sat. He said, you know, it's not in my wish to fly out. I know I've suffered a lot. Even right now, I'm in pain, but I don't want to go out. But the doctors have insisted. But I want you to do one thing for me, and please make sure you do it. Go tell the staff that I am I'm going abroad for a medical review. I will be back, and as soon as I'm back, I'll come to the office. But importantly, I want you to extend my wishes for a bright, prosperous, and a happy new year 2022 to all the staff. Have you heard? I said, Governor, heard. Are you sure? I said, yes. Can you promise me that you're going to do it? I said, Governor, I'll do it. I was so heartbroken. I teared and I asked myself, what is the governor telling me this? Because I saw in his face that there was something that was not right. But I had to do what he asked me to do. Then last week on Thursday after the board meeting, I came back to my office. I felt a very, very heavy heart for the governor. So at 4.30 p.m., I told my assistant, can you buy me a ticket? It's too late to go through the director of the services. Just do anything you can, buy me a ticket. I won't go to Nairobi. So Friday morning, I traveled to Nairobi to go and see the governor in the hospital. Through the help of Dr. Makanga in Nairobi, I was able to get to the ICU where the governor was. But of course, I couldn't enter. I saw him through the glass. I was touched. I broke down. But I told Dr. Makanga that, you know what, what we can do is to pray. So we prayed for about six or so minutes. I looked at the governor. He was sad. I came out of there. I went to be with the family. We prayed. We were there for about three hours. Following day, I was at the airport coming back about one o'clock. Dr. Makanga called me, said, DG, the governor situation is deteriorating. We don't know how much longer we're going to be with him. I said, OK. We've done what you could. The medical team has done what is good. We live with the hands of God. I got back to Kampala. At exactly 4.47 AM, my phone rang. And I normally don't get calls at that time. When I, when I pick up my phone, it was Dr. Makanga. I knew that something not good had happened. And indeed, Dr. Makanda told me that DJ would lost the governor. It was a very sad moment. I have not been myself since then. But then, we thank God for that. So, colleagues, allow me to repeat. We surrender Professor Tumusime Mutabile back to the Creator who gave him to us. As we mourn, our faith tells us that there is indeed life beyond the grave and that God remains faithful to all who believe and follow him. In the words of the bishop today, we have to make up our decisions. Are we going to believe and follow God because there is life beyond the grave? We surrender Professor Tomusimi Mutsebine to our Heavenly Father. And as we do it, let's remember the family 
particularly Mrs. Mutebi, at this very, very trying time is hard. Let's continue to pray for her. Let's support her in any way that we can. On that note, allow me to say, may his soul rest in eternal peace. And I thank you all for your very kind attention. God bless you. Thank you so much, Deputy Governor, for a hope-bringing message. And I request that we give him a hand clap. So ladies and gentlemen, we, have, we are only remaining with one thing, uh, to take the event back to the church, to complete the service for the late for the late Tumusime Emmanuel Mutevire Chirenga Bariabote. Kraje, you are welcome. Before Kraje comes, I wish to recognize the presence of my substantive uh, director of communication, Ms. Charles Mukumia. but also words that are passionate about Professor Mutevile. Uh, together we managed to collect 3,047,000 plus 100 Kenya shillings. We want to thank you so much for the giving. And I want to request one member to come and receive this offering and then hand it over to the family. Yes, I've been asked that the deputy governor receives and then hands it over to the family. of God, which is greater than you can understand. Keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon the Matabide family, rest upon Bank of Uganda and the staff, and the Banking Fraternity of Uganda, 
rest upon each one of you and all those who are prayed for. Remain with us now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. I want to thank you, our Lord Bishop, for leading us and celebrating over this. We thank you, uh, the management of the bank, for giving us this opportunity to celebrate together with you. And we are now going to sing a hymn or a chorus that he loved the most, and that is the Hallelujah Chorus. And let us celebrate together as we sing with the choir.
Praise the 